So hi everyone, my name is Hamid Gafour, so I'm not-for-profit lead for BDO across the north of England. Um, as some of you will probably be aware of, BDO have recently launched their social housing barometer, uh, which is effectively a survey of the, the large housing client base that we have, social housing client base that we have, and looking at what are the key issues and risks impacting on those, on those organisations. And clearly this year has been a an interesting year, to say the least, with the with the impact of COVID and what's been going on there. So to help me discuss some more of the the topics that have come through from the from the survey, um, I have to it today with me um, Nick Horn, who's chief CEO of uh, Widenshaw Community Housing Group (WCHG). Um, and um, Nick, do you want to just introduce yourself in terms of who you are, what you what you do? Yes, for sure. Thank you for that, uh, Hamid. Um, so my name is Nick Horn, and since September 2019, it's been my privilege to be the Chief Executive of Withenshaw Community Housing Group, which, uh, just to orientate you, is um, in South Manchester, just north of Manchester Airport, but south of the city centre. And we are a community anchor organisation formed from two stock transfers uh, years ago that have come together and we have around 13,700 homes, around 23,000 tenants, and uh, we provide housing for around 30 to 40 percent of the population of um, Withenshaw. So, significant anchor business, big employer, um, a big uh, placemaker in the area. <music> So probably just be quite interesting to understand in terms of uh, the last 12 months or so, and certainly post-COVID, the the significant impact that that's had on on your on your organisation. And what 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 do you see as the, the sort of key impacts, and and how do you think the organisation has handled some of those challenges? Sure. Well, I think the biggest impact has not so much been on us as an organisation, but it's been on the communities that we serve. Um, the biggest employer uh, across Withenshaw, obviously, is uh, Manchester Airport, um, which, you know, we don't need to explain what happened to the airport business um, at the start of COVID uh, and the pandemic. So that both directly and through the supply chains has had a significant impact on employment opportunities for people in Withenshaw. Um, Withenshaw itself, as part of Manchester, is in one of the uh, most deprived local authorities in the country. I think Manchester's around number five. The biggest impact was around our need to respond uh, immediately to the different needs of the community. So clearly many of our normal day-to-day -day services we had to suspend um, whilst we evaluated what we could and couldn't do through the early phases of lockdown. Um, but more significantly, we had to um, assess what demand there was coming from the community in terms of what they needed from us. And one of the great strengths of Withenshaw Community Housing Group as, a, as an anchor business is our incredibly strong community investment offer, um, to put that in context, uh, we spend around £2 million a year, given our turnover of around £60 million on community investment activities. And that's across a whole range of, 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 of things. But basically, it means that we have an, a really strong infrastructure in place. And we were able to deploy that infrastructure, both our own resources and also the partnerships that we've got with local agencies to... Uh, almost immediately, really, um, use that to understand what was the new demand as a consequence of the pandemic and how should we respond to that. So, for example, um, we're a major player in uh, the food banks uh, in Withenshaw, and it was perfectly clear that clearly with sharp drops in income for many families, food banks were going to be a vital source of um, daily support for them. So we were able to deploy increased resources there, um, increased resources in also our wider partnerships and using our influence and brand to encourage our businesses, uh, many of whom, although they weren't based in Withenshaw, have an affinity with Withenshaw and its people. 
and really encourage them to donate um, and either money or resources to help support those efforts. And very, uh, very quickly as well, the community responded off its own bat, set up a, a Facebook page, which has well over 5,000 members. And through that, we're able to glean really valuable information about the sort of services that uh, our tenants and the communities uh, in which they live needed from us. So we were able to redeploy skills that we previously had in um, operational um, repairs and maintenance type jobs where we weren't able to do that. But nevertheless, those people were able to come and support our contact center, for example, in doing welfare calls. And um, this is where it got very interesting because um, as we'll talk about a bit later, we discovered that our data was, was quite flaky around uh, our tenants. And although we had you know, pretty good idea of who was over 80, over 70, etc. We didn't really know within those big data sets who actually needed a welfare call because they might uh, need some extra support uh, from us. So that was quite a crude um, approach that we adopted. We just found everyone basically uh, and did something like eight to 10,000 uh, welfare calls over the period of the lockdown to, um, to support the community. And you know, I, I think that was a really, a really great, great example for us of how we were able to help, how we were able to listen to demand, how we were able to uh, morph in a very agile way our service offer, transfer resources from different bits of the business, whilst at the same time deal with the organisational uh, activity of not being able to work from offices. So ours wasn't a business that had been through any significant um, agile working um, program. So all of our staff were either working out in the field as operatives um, or from our community centres or they were working from our main office, which probably had around 250 people working in it. And really within a couple of weeks, mainly thanks to the efforts of our IT team who had, um, you know, had the plans in place to deliver this, we were able to get over 200 people working from home. So the kind of back office support delivery to all of our frontline staff uh, wasn't adversely affected because of the way we were able to achieve that switch, which was a huge, huge positive in many ways. Yeah. You know, with the darkness of the pandemic, I was thinking you have to look for positives. And the positive was that we achieved in that short period of time in terms of making uh, agile working, working from home, offering flexibility to staff we were able to achieve that journey uh, infinitely quicker than we would through a traditional uh, programmed approach. So it was a good example of a burning bridge, driving really dynamic change through the organization. So Nick, Nick, so I mean, when I've talked to organizations, what's really come across, and it's coming across from what you're seeing as well, I think it comes across in our sector, uh, in the sector survey, the robustness of the sector, um, through what we've just been through. And if you compare that to, to other sectors, it, what, the strong position that social housing has compared to other sectors because of the, the model um, that, that, that we have in place. And, and, and clearly, as I think from your, what you're saying, from your perspective, is that that robustness flowed through. And it's, and it's wider than just the financial aspect where financially organisations there has been a challenge, but they've, they've, they're coming through that. Um, but, but also, uh, what's really interesting when you when we you know, you've just talked about is that that housing associations are more than just bricks and mortar. It's the community piece and Widdenshaw. I mean, I know I don't actually live that far away from Widdenshaw, so I know Widdenshaw quite well. And it, it is sort of like it's a bit strange Widdenshaw, isn't it? Because it's sort of like it's Manchester, but it's not because it's a little bit out on the outskirts and it's like a little own little village. Um, uh, on the outskirts of Manchester, so it is something that is is. The, but it's interesting to hear the the the, the way the community uh, has, has joined together, and and uh, and obviously as a sort of uh, a, the, the sort of glue an element is, is, is yourselves really in terms of what because you're such a big player in that in that community. And I think I think what the thing about the pandemic is that it, it was. A, it was a huge shock, but also it was an emotional shock. So uncertainty 
about what it meant on a very daily basis um, was very was was very endemic through all of us really. So our staff, uh, although the business is what I would call you know healthy, not wealthy, it's a it's a you know a sound business part of that business model you've just talked about that ecosystem. Nevertheless, people were thinking, what does this mean for me and my job? And you know, for the business, is this business secure? Will it survive? So quite quickly, we had to manage people's uh, emotional um, engagement with us as well. And we ran all the stress tests and we updated our business plans. And again, within a few weeks, um, you know, we're able to reassure staff that, look, you know, we, we're able to work our way through this. So our primary focus is not around whether we will survive this pandemic. We absolutely uh, will. Um, it is around how do we support the community and our tenants in helping them through this journey. So being able to give people that confidence that we could be outward facing whilst at the same time doing the mechanics of shifting our infrastructure around all within an envelope of knowing that we were a financially stable and secure business albeit working within an uncertain context and fast moving context so i, th I think i would characterize if you I mean i've been around a long time in the sector um the only near precedent to this i think was the financial crash of 2007 where we kind of crept out and then exploded in 2008 and i think up to that time the housing sector had been you know kind of plodding along and i don't mean that in any pejorative way but you could predict a lot of what was going to happen 30-year plans were were quite predictable the financial crash really was a rocket in terms of these incredible events can affect us and although there were human stories within that though that was predominantly not a health um, related issue at all for most of us what this did is it introduced both financial uncertainty and risk a much more widespread risk of business failure affecting far more people on top of that public health risk and absolutely what it's brought home to me is that we don't know what this thing will be, but there will be another thing. You know, we've had a financial crash, we've had a, a global health crisis, something else will come along, you know, whether it's in five years, 10 years, 15 years. So it demands that our strategizing is far more uh, agile in terms of thinking about resilience as a basic um, business principle. So it isn't just about having continuity plans that, you know, pull this lever, push that lever, press this button, do that. It is around thinking about the at least three, if not four dimensions of resilience in our strategy development. And for me, those three dimensions are firstly, how resilient is the community in which we work, to who essentially we are providing services to? And how through our strategy are we um, doing our bit in partnership with others to maintain and sustain and improve that community resilience? Secondly, how financially resilient are we as a business to ensure that we can withstand unknown shocks to the system, whether they're internal to us or um, external from, um, from wider events? And then thirdly, how resilient is our asset base, our properties and our homes and the place in which we work. And what's really interesting at the moment is that you know, being able to really focus in our strategy development and diagnose within each of those the kind of challenges and the strategies that we have to develop to do that. And is, is, that, is, this, is that different to how you thought about it before? Um, I don't think I thought about it in terms of those three dimensions of resilience. So I think previously my view on strategy development was principally around diagnose the problems you're trying to solve, then um, flip those into opportunities that come up with your broad strategic themes, then 
uh, set out some guiding principles for delivering against those themes and then develop the coherent actions that um, underpin how you're actually going to move from where you are now to where you want to be. I think what the pandemic has reinforced is the need for this more overarching strategic framework that really any business needs to have. And I think what's different this time around, partly because of other challenges as well, principally around climate change and decarbonisation, is that it forces strategic decisions about time scales. So, you know, we, we developed a two year business plan, um, corporate plan, pre previously five years. Uh, we thought that was far too long. We can't predict what the future is going to look like um, two years from now, even one year from now. But let's develop a two year plan. And we had our four strategic themes, more homes, great places, living well, and a smarter business, which is great. But within that, we thought we're missing a kind of journey through that two years so that we can draw for our stakeholders that journey. And that was really around the four, four R's about responding immediately to the crisis, then kind of refocusing on starting to look to the future, rebuilding um, based on the data and the evidence and what's coming from the community, and then almost relaunching, you know, which we'll probably do uh, 12 months or 18 months from now, which the relaunch is about then looking to the next five right. years. And hopefully we'll have that confidence. And to do that, we really need to start making those asset allocation decisions, basically, between how much do you invest in the here and now, responding to the presenting demand from the community, and how much do you invest um, in the medium and longer term, for example, in uh, dealing with the challenge of decarbonizing your stock. And so for me, it's like it's a fascinating conundrum, and it's where boards have really got to get to the heart of strategy by choosing between alternatives, both of which have merit, but actually, in reality, as a business, you can only afford to do elements of both or more of one and less than the other. Nicola, I really liked it. It's really interesting, actually, because we, you know, when you talk to organizations, whatever strategy they had previously is, is out the window <laughs> at the moment, isn't it? Because of what happened. Because that's, and the fact that you have sort of almost gone back to basics in looking at your strategy. So actually, there's no point looking at the five years ahead. We're looking just two years because at the moment, that's the right time frame. And even 12 months is a struggle. I think it's really, really interesting that you've, you've You've actually fought strategic. You've actually fought strategically like that as a as a management team and a, and a board. And um, and I'm quite and very, that's very commercial as well. I, I, I you know I'm, so it's quite it's it's quite a quite an interesting uh, insight into the way you're looking to keep what you're doing relevant as you move forward. For us now, strategy is much more of a dynamic concept because it comes down to making these choices between these three points on the triangle of resilience and how we flex and move that triangle forward over time to deal with the short, medium and longer term challenges. And one of the things that, you know, amazingly was really positive that came out of our response to the pandemic was we realised how poor our data was and also our data infrastructure. Now, we have lots of data, but Really, this showed that when it when it came to the crunch, could we drill down and say, right, we've got 45 staff set up to do welfare calls. Um, let's stratify our, our residents and, and look at who are those who most need support by analysing our data. We just didn't have it. Yeah. So yeah. Now, a kind of key part of our smarter business infrastructure is we absolutely need a big push on data and information government strategy. So we've literally just set up a, a group of staff to start looking at that and leading on that. I just sort of thought it'd be interesting just to sort of explore your views on that, how you change, think the, the emphasis will change. Because some of the things you're talking about now with tenants and some of the things 
around the, the, the new charters in terms of the white paper, how that that will you think that will impact on and social housing generally, with your experience, social housing generally, but also on with insurance in particular, and what and what your what what that means in terms of what you need to do as you move forward. Yeah, and and I mean I, I might be wrong, but my own take on if I had to say there are three big themes that come out of that white paper, I'd say the first big theme is around uh, building safety and the state of your property assets. Um, the second big theme is around consumer uh, standards, really. And the third one is around tenant engagement. And I think those, for an anchor organisation such as WCHG, were quite fortunate in the sense that tenant engagement and um, delivery of our consumer standards is a kind of living, breathing thing. Um, so to give you an example, 20% of our staff are tenants. So if you know they have repairs that need doing, they are testing the service all the time for us. So whilst we have um, improving and really good ways of engaging more widely with tenants across the piece, actually, we've also got 100 or so staff who are able to, on a daily basis, give us that intel about um, how we're delivering those services. And, and you know, and that's a kind of gift really of, of being who we are, where we are and doing the work that we, that we do. Also over half our staff live in Withenshaw. And again, you know, they provide a kind of eyes and ears to what's going on, what's being talked about, how are we being perceived? Um, you know, I meet with councillors regularly um, and we talk about that, you know, we have full and frank discussions about what's working well, what are they getting through their um, uh, email account and directly on the, on, the, on the door from residents about what we're doing well and not working. So we are able to kind of nuance that. But I think the, the big kind of overlay of that is none of us are clear what the post-pandemic dust to settle landscape is going to look like for Withenshaw. And your comment earlier was brilliant that, you know, really Withenshaw is part of Manchester, but it, it has that air of being a separate yeah. sense of identity, because in many ways it's physically very different from other parts of Withenshaw, uh, from other parts of Manchester. Um, and, you know, that sense of community cohesiveness is incredibly strong, and we want to build on that. So I think the white paper does demand of us exactly the sort of strategic choices that boards are now going to have to make. We have to look very hard at our assets, particularly for those of us who own over 18 metre tower blocks. You know, we've got over 10, for example. You know, we have to invest a lot more in our uh, building safety uh, property standards. We have to uh, invest more in our decarbonisation. Um, which, you know, particularly came out of the recent uh, regulator of social housing's risk uh, review, which, you know, there was a lot of good subliminal messages in there about that, that we need to take on board. And that's something that we're, you know, well developed in terms of doing. <music>
organizational purpose. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean by that a sort of fluffy, you know, we're here to create wonderful places full of happy human beings, and that's it. Because that's, that's, that's too motherhood and apple pie, really. Mm -hmm. By purpose, I mean a cohesive narrative over one or two pages that says, this is why we exist. And in the day-to-day, year-on-year delivery of our why, these are the things that we will do and how we will make the choices. And that can be eight or 10 statements, really, around all the different aspects of things that are important to that organization. Nick, I think, um, actually, that's been really useful talk talking to you today. I mean, it's been really interesting to talk about the journey that um, Widenshaw uh, has been on and the robustness it showed um, throughout the, the pandemic. But also what's really fascinating is the, the community piece that you talked about and how you, you, you continue to do that. And you're seeing that as something that is even an increasing part for your organization, particularly through the data uh, cleanse that you're you're going through and making sure next if some you know you have the right data in in place and then linking all that up with some of the the challenges for the future and the choices the organisation needs to make but without forgetting that that community purpose um, it's been really interesting talking to you today thank you very much it's a privilege to have this conversation thank you Hamid. cheers. <laughs>